Here we go. My name is Beth Fairchild. I'm a tattooist who specializes in permanent cosmetics and areola tattooing for breast cancer patients who lost their breasts due to mastectomy. I was really drawn to permanent cosmetics. Um, my mom had stage two breast cancer in 2011 and she lost half of her breast and I realized that there was a need for that. I just never really thought about it before. All right, hop up and take a look. Oh my God, I love it. <laughs> This is a life-changing tattoo. And it's like the end of their journey, like the completion of the process. And so to be a part of that, to be a positive part of that, it's really rewarding. Thank you. You're welcome. It's so exciting. <laughs> they finally look normal again. This work is really important to me because I'm also a breast cancer patient. I was diagnosed with metastatic breast cancer in May of 2014. It was difficult at times for me to talk to early stage patients because their focus was body image. You know, I had these clients who were coming to me to be restored and to be uplifted. And the last thing I wanted to do was tell them, I have metastatic cancer and I'm gonna die from breast cancer. My diagnosis was really a shock. Um, I mean, I suppose it is for everyone who goes in and discovers that they have a lump in their breast, but that wasn't the case for me. I had been having some intestinal distress, bloating, I couldn't eat a full meal. I was feeling really fatigued, and so my doctor said, I'm going to need you to see an oncologist. I mean, it terrified me. So I made an appointment to see an oncologist, and I went in, and he said, your ovaries need to come out. And I wake up from that surgery, and they said, you know, we found cancer. It's not ovarian cancer breast cancer in your pelvis and that means you're stage four and while there are some treatments available it's not curable and you have about two years give or take depending on how you respond or don't respond to treatment my mom was diagnosed pretty young uh, I think she was 44 my mom's mom was diagnosed in her 70s. Um, my dad's biological mother was dead of metastatic cancer at 33. Clearly there's something in our genetics that's causing this. For me, the hard part is thinking about my daughter. I can't imagine her down the road being diagnosed with cancer and going through some of the things that I've been through without her mom. And I know that um, the chances of me being around in 10 years are pretty slim. I was 14 when I found out my mom had breast cancer. My mom told me about the time that she found out her mom had breast cancer, and she said it felt like you were getting hit by a train. And that's like what it felt like, you know? Like, your whole world just stopped, and I was like, wow. And it was just hard on our whole family, you know? My marriage ended. I was married for 10 years. And, um, you know, I love my husband dearly. I still love him. But my life changed, and I wanted to live a different life that he wanted to live. And so we went our separate ways. You know, I had the big house and the nice car, and I don't need any of that anymore. None of that stuff fills me up. I get up without any expectations of, you know, what's gonna happen or what the day's gonna bring. I just wanna get up and, and live my best life. It's really cool to see your kids grow and learn. Thank you, ma'am. And become productive members of society, you know? And then when, not only did I get to raise her, I mean, I had the privilege of being her mom, but now I get to teach her this craft that she's gonna take and leave her mark on the world. I think that's pretty cool. This is the motor that drives it. Mm -hmm. And this should pop in here. Have you played with it already? No, I haven't.
Working at the tattoo shop, it's pretty fun. I either work the front or I'm there with my mom, um, like learning and practicing. She's teaching me how to tattoo. I have all these ideas of what I want her to go and do, and tattooing's not necessarily at the top of the list, but if it feels good to her and it feeds her soul, then I'm all about it. <laughs> that was a good night. It was. We laughed so much that night. Mm -hmm. Miss my friend. A lot of the people in this book are dead, and that's hard. It's a um, harsh reality that that's what awaits me down the line. I try not to look towards the future too much. I try to stay really present. Um, but I would love to see my daughter get married. I would like to see her after. I think I'd be a really great grandmother. <laughs> but I want my grandchildren to um to know me. And I wanna know them. And I don't wanna just be in a box for Leanne to show them pictures of me. I wanna be able to hold them and love them like I did her. I wanna be able to hold her hand when she's And God forbid she ever gets sick, I wouldn't be able to be there for her. It's my biggest fear is that Leanna will have cancer like me, and that I won't be here for her. I'm very scared. Me and my mom have had serious conversations about like steps I need to take and steps like we should take together to figure out a plan for me. Getting mammograms like the 3D ones even. We've talked about getting a mastectomy before just to maybe cancel it out altogether, you know? Um, but it is scary, yeah. When I was first diagnosed, uh, my disease was widespread and every bone in my body my entire pelvic cavity and my liver. I had my port inserted and I started chemotherapy. I did it every week for six months. I was nauseous, was tired, I lost my hair, but the treatment wasn't terrible and my cancer responded really well. Sucks. But if it sucks the cancer right out of you, then yeah, chemo. <laughs> My presentation of metastatic breast cancer is very unusual in that I never experienced a lump in my breast. I was worried that uh, there was a tumor that they just weren't able to find, and the potential of that tumor feeding my metastases was driving me nuts. And uh, eventually, I chose to have a mastectomy. I was for sure they would find cancer in the tissue that they took off, but they didn't. And um, that was fine. I was still happy that I made the decision and I chose to live flat for three years. When I was living flat after my mastectomy, I was a champion for women living flat. I think it's beautiful. I think that, you know, your scars tell a story. And there's honestly nothing more beautiful than a woman who's comfortable in her own skin, no matter what that looks like. After three years went by, you know, I was five years out from my original diagnoses, and I'm still healthy. And I just was so frustrated with um, buying bathing suits that didn't fit, or dresses, or tops, and everything that I would purchase, I would have to have altered. I was considering reconstruction and I talked to both my doctors who said, if that's what you want to do, this is a really great time for you to do it. I remember going to buy a swimsuit when I still had my expanders in 
and I was so excited and I you know was putting on my tops and doing a little photo shoot in the dressing room and I can wear a bathing suit on the beach and feel like I used to feel before cancer. It's just fun to be curvy and feminine again. <laughs> <laughs> I was pretty much resigned to the fact that I would just live here until the day I died and that I would probably never date or have a serious relationship because, you know, I have a terminal illness. Are you online shopping again? No. I was uh, doing an event at New York Fashion Week. My friend has a line of lingerie specifically for women who have had mastectomies or reconstruction and I met this guy who was on set as a medic. God, boy, you're so photogenic. Look, he's so pretty. Just before I went out on the stage, I uh, rolled my ankle, and as I stumbled, I just put my arm out to reach for balance, and the first thing that I grabbed was David's arm. <laughs> <laughs> I looked up and saw those beautiful blue eyes, and I just knew that he was my person. That was a year and a half ago. We've spent many plane rides back and forth because we have a long distance relationship. But he is just everything that I needed. He is so complimentary and I to him. And that's what makes our relationship work. This looks so good. I've heard that people don't want to get into relationships with people who have a terminal illness and Beth constantly asks me why I'm in this relationship with her and why I'm willing to put up with all of this. You get no guarantees with any relationship that you get into regardless of what their medical history is. That relationship could end in a month or three months. You might as well enjoy it while you're in it. And if it's really good, then congrats. Good choice. <laughs> If you lose sight of the person because of a diagnosis, you lose something. I would have lost so much personal growth. I would have lost so much love. I would have lost so many opportunities to do something with someone so amazing. I think that there is such a barrier in the cancer community when it comes to relationships and people actually talking about real issues. Intimacy with someone who is taking a rigor of medicine is a real issue in a lot of relationships. With the loss of my ovaries came sexual dysfunction. I have a lot of issues that a woman in her 60s would have, like vaginal atrophy. So dryness, um, when you want to be intimate with someone and your body just doesn't work. You know, when you're in your 30s, that's a really hard thing to come to terms with. I think it's very important that you have a lover who is understanding of what you're going through and who is patient. Because of the side effects of the medications that I'm currently on and because of the um, previous chemotherapy, I have tons of side effects. It's, um, we call it collateral damage. I now have a multitude of medications that I have to take to combat these side effects. Medications for nausea, a muscle relaxer, um, a pain reliever, a pain reliever, anti-anxiety medication, another antibiotic, an antifungal. There's just so many different things that you don't think about. The worst side effect that I have from my therapy is arthritis and um, just having inflammation and pain in virtually every joint in my body. When I wake up in the morning, I'm really stiff and painful. All of my joints um, are cracking and popping as I'm first up and moving around the house. And I know that the sooner that I'm on my mat and I'm moving, the better my joints are going to feel. I really think of yoga. Um, not as just a practice or a meditation, but as an integral part of my integrative therapy. I remember when I was diagnosed and 
thinking that I would never see 40. Happy birthday. Oh, thanks. And happy birthday. Thank you. You're welcome. I've lost so many friends in the last five years. So there's a lot of guilt that comes with celebrating turning 40. It's surreal. It's almost like a like a dream, like it's so impossible that it's hard to believe that it's happened, that I'm here. She had two year lifespan, you know? And she's gone way past that. I'm like, it's crazy. Birthday, birthday dance, birthday yoga. <laughs> When she was given her diagnosis, she wasn't told that she'd be around for 40. She was not given much time at all. And surprise, surprise, here she is. And so I'm really glad that I get to be here to spend her milestone birthday with her. Happy birthday, dear mama. Happy birthday to you. I mean, so grateful that I had five years. And now that 40's here, I wanna see 50. And I think part of the thing that makes me upset is knowing that the reality is that I probably won't see 50. And um, that's okay, you know? Maybe I will, who knows? I didn't think I'd be here today. But I'm definitely looking forward to whatever 40 brings.